Uh, okay, I apologize for forget like two Manila folders, both exactly the same. <laughs> I just took the wrong one off the counter. Um, so I apologize for that. So yes, this is um, slightly different than the title of the talk that was advertised, as well as the uh, description. So um, it's a similar theme and subject matter, but slightly different content and case studies. Instead of Edward Bertinsky, I'm going to be talking about plastic, but it's still the same idea of a kind of dark sublime that colors the contemporary landscape of um, visual media, visual aesthetics. And so it is indeed a chapter from my larger book project on high-tech trash, glitch, noise, and failure aesthetics, which is near completion. And this is actually the postscript from, from that project. I, I began this project a few years ago, sort of very um, frustrated with all the garbage in New York City. Like, it's, it's very dirty and smelly. And um, this is where this idea of, of trash and garbage and plastic and e-waste and stuff came from. And, uh, but this is actually the first time I've talked, uh, talked on this material and semi-public, I guess. So, uh, anyways, okay, so to begin then. Um, so best-selling Japanese author, Mary Kondo. Are, you, is, are people familiar with Mary Kondo's work? Author of The Life-Changing Magic of Tidying Up, who <laughs> preaches this, you know, purge all, get rid of everything, like six pairs of socks, six pairs of, you know, just, you know, only have a very minimalist, radically minimalist lifestyle. And uh, so on the surface, this would, you know, seem to be a very appropriate refusal of consumer excess of having so much stuff, right? But uh, at the same time, I also think it's ironic that by encouraging everyone to get rid of all their stuff, she's contributing to these cycles of waste and obsolescence of things in material culture. So it would be unfair to suggest that she's responsible for this idea of planned obsolescence, but uh, she does in some way contribute to these cycles of consumption and discard in um, <clears throat> in contemporary culture. So um, David Sachs, who's writing for Esquire, says um, she he critiques her fashionable brand of decluttering as catering to our culture's virtual fantasies of becoming immaterial, like just being able to live without stuff and things and being hampered down. But it, it really appeals to that, you know, that cultural fantasy and that mythology of being sort of transcendent from the material world. And of course, having sold six million copies of her book, it's evidence that a lot of people really enjoy, enjoy that fantasy, enjoy subscribing into that. Uh, Oh, oh it, it's this. That's a different talk. <laughs> the glitch talk was last week. Okay. Uh, Pushing it <laughs> I know. Um, uh, okay, so, so planned obsolescence, right? This fantasy to live without stuff, and yet here we are with tons and tons of stuff everywhere <laughs> around us. And this idea of plans obsolescence, which is in fact a managerial strategy that developed in the 17th century to encourage consumption, right? Ultimately to boost the economy. Uh, people wanted people to buy things and get rid of them sooner than they were used up or done, right? And uh, so in Nicholas Barbon's 1690 Discourse on Trade, he says, fashion or the alteration of dress is a great promoter of trade because it occasions the expensive clothes before the old ones are worn out. So this is where the early sort of seeds of plants obsolescence starts to come into effect, where we um, uh, entrepreneurs, producers start to get the idea that they can make more money if only they can convince people that they need to buy more things before they actually have worn out the other ones. Uh, but <coughs> plant obsolescence itself doesn't really become a formal strategy until the early 20th century, until around the 1920s, when it was used to um, to mend the culture of the economic depression. And so Bernard London in 1932 wrote this pamphlet on ending the depression through planned obsolescence. 
And here, London proposes a government agency to oversee and determine the legal lifespan of each manufactured object. So he actually proposed that it should be a crime for people to disobey these laws by keeping stuff around, quote, using their old cars, their old tires, their old radios, and their clothing much longer than statistically expected. <laughs> OK, and people should be taxed for doing such things, for using legally dead, as he writes. I'm just looking for my my secret cough candy stash, <laughs> um, which I don't seem to have. OK, wrong bag. <laughs> OK, anyways. Um, <clears throat> So, um, so another benchmark in this development of planned obsolescence occurs through the post-war America. Post-war, right, of course, has boosted consumerism and post-war American culture. And mid-century designer Brooks Stevens encourages consumers to own something a little newer, a little better, a little sooner than is necessary. Right, and so again, this this thing of just. Uh, wanting to just, oh, it's a little better, it's a little different, right, even though it's not really substantially or significantly different. But it's this mentality that um, has been critiqued uh, from Marx through Thorstein Veblen through Barbara Kruger's 1984, um, A Shop, Therefore I Am, which is kind of, you know, all dating back to this critique of using material consumption or material objects as a way of uh, qualifying being or existence. Mika White, a contemporary scholar, also observes the strangeness of these ideas that we have around consumption, where she writes, quote, um, we are constantly replacing the objects in our daily life, which keeps us locked into our overworked, overstimulated, and underpaid di daily grind. We work to buy things that are built to die so that we must work to buy more things that will break. So. Um, there's various levels of this critique of consumerism in theory in contemporary art world. And when we start to think about technology in the high tech world, uh, we think about e tech, where this idea of planned obsolescence is only exacerbated by companies like Apple, just the easiest target, only because they've recently come into the mass media. As um, if you recall, maybe a year ago, where they slowed down the speed of their current iPhone model in order to encourage consumers to purchase their like negligibly newer, updated model, right? But the but this is and this was only one sliver of their you know very rigorous strategy for planned obsolescence that we become aware of. But meanwhile, they're doing many things like using sodium these sort of lithium batteries that will have shorter and shorter lifespans and soldering parts of the motherboard into uh, the, the unit itself so that it can't be taken for repairs, but instead it's just cheaper to buy a new one. So that it's a very um, elaborate strategy that is just increased. One, that's Apple's only one company of many who are contributing to this um, growing heaps of e-tech waste, electronic technology waste. So the average lifespan of computers in 1997 was gauged to be six years. And in 2005, it went down to just two years. And now, I mean, if, uh, sorry, 2000 and, in 2017, mobile phones are estimated to have a life cycle of less than 16 months, whereas it, in 2005, it was two years. OK, I think something's, oh, OK, forget that. Quote was a little off. Here's another one. The United Nations Environment Program estimates 50 million tons of electronic waste in 2017. So again, slightly outdated statistic, but still astounding number, 50 million tons of electronic waste. It's almost like impossible to even imagine what that could even look like, um, primarily from computers and, and cell phones, which is up 20% from 2015. So in two years, the gross quantity of e-waste goes up 20%. And I mentioned already Apple um, admittedly slowing down the phones, um, introducing these lithium polymer batteries, which die very quickly. And I mean, this is also linked into like China and their you know decision to use certain materials in the products that are shipped to the West versus their own products. Anyways, that's perhaps a different issue. Um, so pentagram designer Darren Blum um, jokes, he says, we joke that we design landfills, like because they're just you know, making so much crap that just ends up 
becoming obsolete so quickly, but it's really not less of a joke than it's it's less of a joke than it is like a kind of dark um, insight into what's really going on in this e-tech world. So one offshoot of a theory and critical approach to media that I adopt throughout this project and my earlier one is media archaeology, which is the material examination of, of archival objects. And so one offshoot of media archaeology is called zombie media. And zombie media are practitioners and theorists who argue that media never die, but instead, after their so-called functional use in first world um, situations, still circulate and become a part of the social life of other, um, uh, other countries and other spaces. So in some of the work on Brutinsky and other, I look at um, ship breaking and e-waste recycling practices. So zombie media and me media archaeology is the framework that I look at e-tech and waste obsolescence. Uh, so instead of now thinking about the most newest, sometimes we, it's hard for us to see the dirt and the waste and the trash in the newest of new media because the shinier something looks, the more valuable it seems. So one of the reasons why I chose to look at plastic at the end of the book is because it's arguably an older media, right? It had its heyday of magical new media substance miraculous plastic in the mid 20th century. And so now looking back at it, we can actually see more of a trajectory of its total lifespan from shiny new to old and dead. And so that's that's what the remainder of the talk will look at, the story of plastic. Um, it, so its origins as a utopian substance through this ontologically darker life as a retrograde sublime. So in 1947, this magazine, House Beautiful, says, Plastics, a better way to a more carefree life. <laughs> Plastic, Roland Barthes wrote in 1954, quote, is the first magical substance that consents to be prosaic. Which is interesting, because if we think about what's happening around the mid-century era, um, what is... Um, elite and prestigious is, is just that elite, not necessarily vernacular or prosaic or available to the masses, but plastic all of a sudden changes that. It makes it available for everyone to have access to this magnificent new commodity life. Um, so, um, and, and you know, every, the, everything, these tables are plastic, that stand is plastic, so much of of what we consume in daily life is plastic. Toothbrushes, water bottles, plastic bags, doorknobs, chewing gum, cellophane, plastic wrap, elect parts of electronics and computers. We would sort of be lost without plastic and all that it affords for us. So this really, we don't see it so much anymore, but at the time, plastic um, was literally seen as like a, ma a magical, amazing thing, right? This, um, so many good things in plastic which looks like crazy that they would think of doing this, but it was like, so it was plastic was so honored, you know, it was like this amazing thing that um, these polyurethane plastic bags could, were housing babies and kids. Um, and they also, you know, plastic at the time made several innovations in medical profession and science. So they made it, um, electronic wires, coating of wires, which allowed electricity to flow more quickly and safely, which was like electric wires were exposed before. It was very dangerous. Also, blood transfusions became safe and more common through these vinyl uh, blood bags that were developed from plastic. And then dentistry, certain plates for making moldings, uh, rubber plates of mouths, which really transformed these professions. So it really, it really is magic. And like I don't, by focusing on the dark side of new media, I don't mean to take away from the fact that new media have many affordances and give us great, wonderful mm -hmm. things in our lives. Uh, so plastics, in short, are like what qualifies them as a particular media is that they're flexible, they're easy to produce, they're versatile, and few. they're one of the rare modern or natural substances that can compete in so many different areas. They can really make interventions in more than areas than just like computer graphics or whatever. Um, okay, so this fashion for plastics begins around uh, the 1890s. George Eastman, you know, early um, 
films, um, the base for her film, Celluloid, is made in um, 1870 by uh, Wellesley Hyatt. And um, eventually these Bakelite plastic buttons become all the rage by, developed by Leo Bakeland around 1909, a New York-based chemist who used these heat and compression techniques to mix carbolic acid in formaldehyde uh, to produce this non-dissolvable, non-conducive material. Uh, and these are like the sort of vintage Bakelite buttons. And um, as we know with plastic, it can mold itself so flexibly into so many different forms. It really um, had this amazingly transformative potential. It also uh, helped serve efforts during the war um, in GI combs, mortar fuses, parachutes, gunners, bugles. I don't know exactly what these things are. Um, also, Hollywood um, relied on a lot of plastic celluloid film, of course, but also um, what Judith Brown calls a disposable glamour of Hollywood glamour, which is this use of um, metaphors in plastic, shine, shiny surfaces, lighting effects, synthetic auras all feed into this kind of very plasticky, mirrory, shiny, flexible, malleable, because plastic is, is shiny too, right? Plastic has this weird shine to it. Um, so plastic became such a big deal that a historian of plastic, a science writer Susan Frankel reports, the word cellophane was des designated the third most beautiful word in the English language <laughs> after mother and memory. <laughs> Um, okay, and so contenders of plastic, like, and what it actually, the ramifications of it, were slowly picking up, but just one or two, you know, the plastic enters the visual sculpture and the visual arts. Um, as soon as plastics became feasible for art making, they also became used in water-soluble acrylic paints, because this is Bridget Riley's cover of the 1965 art exhibition at the MoMA. Uh, because they allow for this very precise um, detailing, the acrylic, the use of plastic instead of like like oil kind of bleeds, right? And um, this is uh, Thelma Newman's more amorphous use of plastic. So this is really like the style, tending to this geometric modernism, clean lines, um, but also kind of aberrancy within that is this more cosmological kind of sculpture from Thelma Newman. Um, and in interior design, this use of plastic for spaces uh, between um, interior design, aesthetics, and architecture. Okay, uh, major exhibitions are devoted to plastic, um, which are foregrounding these tensions between art and industry because the plastic is very chemically produced. It's undeniable that it's a not, of course, it's synthetic. It's very synthetic substance. This is the cover of the 1968 exhibition Plastic as Plastic held at the Museum of Contemporary Crafts, which at the time was still in New York. And so um, it has a, a less optimistic take on plastic, or maybe it's more prescient of the kind of dark life that plastic will amount to. Um, and uh, contenders of plastic just as a valid art medium begin to emerge in the art world. So for example, in 1966, uh, Hilton Kramer, writing for the New York Times, is critiquing an exhibition of plastic at the Whitney and he says, well, he simultaneously louds and trashes the, quote, condition of sculpture in this country. On the one hand, he finds, quote, youth in the saddle full of energies and aspirations that are cheerfully and militantly in pursuit of, a new, mo of new modes and sensibilities. On the other hand, he finds himself appalled with the, quote, superficial glitter of oversized plastic toys and ersatz geometric monuments passing for serious sculptural statements. So um, he begins to question if whether or not this is even art because it's so, like, you know, displaying commercial objects. Um, but it's really kind of a stodgy old world view because, uh, as some of us might agree, uh, or it has always been commercial. Um, so he says, uh, in order, you know, 
plastics introduce a Faustian freedom, Kramer concludes. The answer to an artist's dream, plastic is the answer to an artist's dream, right, because it's so flexible and malleable, but only if the artist is willing to pay the high price of, quote, sharing the mechanism of creation with technical processes not always susceptible to the artist's will. So in other, in other words, the materiality of the technology, of the medium, um, structures the conditions of possibility of what can be made with it. And I think that this is an appropriate insight, um, or appropriate thing to highlight here, because in our school we have, I mean, in our faculty, we have nine schools where we're all working with different medium, and we're so attuned to what those parameters are of our, of our particular you know, film or TV or whatever it is. And it seems to just be something we work with. Not, it's not a Faustian trade, like, oh, you know, I'm going to work with digital media, but that means, like, anyways. Um, okay, so otherwise, concerns about plastic started to emerge well beyond the art world um, into culture, where it's sort of parodied here a little bit. Just if you remember the scene from The Graduate. I make the job future. Right, so they're concerned with Ben's future, right? But in the grant, Ben, here, the character. Well, that's a little hard to say. Ben, next season. Mr. McGuire. Um, what, why is that not playing? I believe there's probably an error. I opened it in a separate window because it wasn't working then either. So oh. go on to the oh, Safari yeah. browser. I have the oh, actual the film clip. I, I found it on YouTube as well. Well, I sent it to you also, right? Yes, you did. It's just yeah. not. It's just it was okay. Not so working. what do you want me to do? Uh, just. You mean open a different window here? Yep, it's right there. That's just the. I need the job. Okay. Here. You're alive. Well, that's a little hard to say. Ben, next season. Oh, yeah, you think it PowerPoints it? Just, just put, it. put the PowerPoint. Just, just go ah. escape and, and then, and then <coughs> find the window. Oh, oh, I see what you're saying. Okay. So escape from this. Yeah, and then the other window should be there. Yeah, I've noticed that's happening um, before. Yeah. This should work. Okay, so Ben's future. <laughs> Okay, so that's all from that. Uh, it's funny because I feel like people today tell me the same stuff about marijuana stocks and Bitcoin. <laughs> 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 but we'll see what happens with that. Um, so it's kind of becomes, uh, you know, vernacular cultural knowledge that it's like, you know, like the same way Bitcoin is today, plastics, plastics. Uh, but meanwhile, there are a lot of um, concerns about plastics that are growing in the background. I mentioned the sort of snobbery of art world criticism, but as well environmental and health concerns that are coming up around plastic, namely um, these experiments that are being done in science where they're finding that rat livers that are that are being wrapped in these certain plastic begin to get tumors and certain um, of the plasticizers the DEHP plasticizers begin to break down in the vinyl blood bags that were created and they leach into the fluids that are being absorbed into the rat organs and then patients who have received treatments with these new miraculous plastic bags um, begin to um, get traces of plasticizers in their blood levels. Um, even people who are using plastic hoses in the garden, in their gardens, um, get traces of plasticizers. So um, people are becoming aware of this, 
um, but they still sort of the official statement is, oh, yes, like there are low levels of them, but they're not that harmful. They're, quote, fine for human health, except under very, very particular rare circumstances, like maybe even how, you know, people talked about smoking or something at some point in time. So um, this is what leads us to the retrograde su uh, sublime, um, which, uh, <coughs> you know, this controversy of the effects and causes of disease, death, toxins, and environmental breakdowns as related to plastic has, as we know now, only grown over recent years. And there's substantial evidence from company, or not companies, um, bodies like the Toxic Substance Control Act, which was passed by U.S. Congress in 1976 and administered by the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, EPA, to regulate the chemical industry. But this policy, right, the Toxic Substances Control Act of 1976, the policy states that um, manufacturers in the U.S., for example, are, only have it as an option that they have to say what chemicals were used in their development. So they don't necessarily have to uh, explain how much plastic is used in their production of their products. So they identify it as being dangerous, but it's optional. So they, there's only so much they can do to regulate it if they're not aware of how much is actually being used in certain products. Um, one other issue that we're aware of or more familiar with is the polyethylene terephthalate, PET, which is used in soda pop and water bottles, right, which we still all drink in. And you'll often see like, or um, PET or bisphenol A, like BPA free, like you'll see that on certain plastic, but, um, because there is another controversial plasticizer, which was used in numerous um, consumer products, medical supplies, safety equipment, et cetera, et cetera. So that's why sometimes you'll see people speaking to that concern through their advertising. But then it's like, who knows what else they're making it with that we just haven't become aware of that issue yet. Um, <clears throat> so clearly this once magical substance has fallen from its pedestal, you know, its moment of grace and levels of production are clearly not stopping, right? We're just producing more and more plastic and, and getting rid of it. Um, so over the last 60 years, the use of plastic has increased almost 20 fold with an annual production reaching 28 million tons in 2011, which is like a long time ago already, and that's already 280 million tons. Again, an inconceivable amount of waste. According to Ellen Gamerman, one million plastic bags are used every minute in the United States, or used every minute, while the US alone goes through one billion, 100 billion plastic shopping bags annually. And it's, I mean, this is a hard one too, because I know how bad plastic bags are, and I still feel like I don't know what I would do without them. I feel like I, I, at some point, there's some times where they're just, there's no, nothing else that would fill the, that void, <laughs> the plastic bag. So where do they all go, all these plastic bags? So they end up, a lot of them, in the ocean, uh, which is also the site that supplied the fossil fuels to process natural oils, which generated the byproducts that was used to develop the plastics in the first place. So the oceans are now greeted with their perverse offspring. Plastics that do not biodegrade, right? Polyurethane takes a thousand years to break down and contain toxic debris that contaminate soil, ocean life, and waterways. And uh, the garbage patch plastic is one of the places in the world, a patch of ocean in the world, where a lot of this plastic ends up. It's an area of the Pacific Ocean that is approximately twice the size of Texas. And here um, we have ocean life and marine vertebrae, like birds, dolphins, fish, um, who mistake this plastic as either food or prey. And so, because they're often colorful and they think that they're other fish. And so they end up eating it, ingesting it, or feeding it to their young. And um, we have, okay, extensive ingestion in plastic is called ghost nut. Approximately 1 billion seabirds and mammals die from eating plastic bags. So this horrifying situation is um, addressed in part in the work of Chris Jordan, 
who is a Seattle-based photographer, former defense attorney who quit and decided to start doing photography in the early 2000s. And he addresses this dark side of 21st century plastic. Um, in this piece here that I'm focusing on is his Midway <laughs> message, Messages from the Geyer Project, which began in 2009. And it focuses on this Midway Atoll, which is a cluster of islands in the patch, the plastic patch, um, more than two, uh, about 2,000 miles away from the nearest continent. So it's really out in the middle. And he uh, analyzes how the plastic detritus of consumer culture surfaces inside the stomachs of thousands of dead baby albatrosses. That's the focus of his project. Uh, parents feed their nesting chicks these lethal, lethal quantities of plastic. So here we see the darkness of commodity desire, right? The colors are still bright and shiny, but the context that we now are exposed to them in is really disturbing, and it's a reality that is often kept, you know, producers, companies want to keep this out of our mind and view. Um, and so part of the project of zombie media and media archaeology is to uh, return these things that are cast aside and pushed away from dominant views, dominant stories of technology, and bring them back into the fold to show that media are not dead, but they have an afterlife here. And um, media archaeology has been growing for a few decades um, through people like Siegfried Zielinski and other German media scholars and in the United States and Canada. Um, and so as it grows in intellectual, artistic, and academic fashions, it also, it does so appropriately alongside these industrial design trends in, you know, more disposable, miniaturized black boxes of technology, which are, of course, not quite bl literal black boxes, but colorful and shiny boxes, multicolored plastic boxes. Uh, that um, we need to contend with, right? In the age of innovation and in a world of high tech, which is what we all use and many of us study and think about, uh, we also need to address this other side. And so I close with um, this quote um, from the Bauhaus artist, <coughs> Laszlo Moholy Naji. He says, a future generation, and he said this in 19, the 1960s about plastic. And I, so I argue the same thing applies for us today with our new media, our electronic media. A future generation of artists can still take heed from Laszlo Moholy Naji, who argued over half a century ago that artists working with plastics, quote, inevitably have to take up scientific studies or else wait decades until knowledge about plastics becomes commonplace. Uh, but the, and so the same, I would say, goes for silicon, precious metal, plastic wires, and all the e-waste that we have generated through our laptops and cell phones in so many countries that first world privileged citizen, citizens will never see and never travel to and never be exposed to. And so we have a responsibility to see that in the fact also that these cycles are so much quicker and faster. It's not like, it, you know, plastic's amazing and then 50 years later we start to, you know, it's like we can immediately detect the underside of it. And this is the retrograde sublime, extraordinary and unfathomable. And it's concealment of our errors, because we produce these things, our errors, trash and waste in so-called faraway places that new and perverse modern technologies are now brought back into the field of our vision, of our vision but brought so close that we can no longer deny it as if it was a product of our own making. So this is like, the, this is us. This is like the thought that um, I want to end this on is that like we've, we've created this world, you know, and I'm not su suggesting like we should feel bad or ashamed because like we're using a plastic bottle, but you know, and certainly corporations and policies are responsible for this as well, but that it's a collective effort and collective awareness. So, that's, that's where I'll stop. I'm happy to hear any thoughts or questions or anything. <laughs> this is Wally. Um, hey. 
Actually, in terms of um, artists, we've been looking at Kelly Jasak. Um, how do you spell her <coughs> last name? Uh, J A Z B A C. J A J A Z B A C. Okay. Um, but in particular, she was working with a geologist and going to a beach in Hawaii. Mm -hmm. And what it was is all of the plastic debris from the oceans end up on the beach. People have bonfires. The plastic sort of congeal into these rock-like formations. Mm -hmm. And they're called plastoglomerates. And the thing is, they're now recognized as a type of rock. Oh, really? So it's the first officially recognized type of rock that is fully human made. Oh, that's cool. And it becomes this sort of uh, <clears throat> very particular symbol of the Anthropocene because it is now, now we're making rocks. Never mind making other things, but we're actually making a rock. Um, and she's done a number of shows, so it's been a bit of a series that she's worked on. And the horrible practice is based around plastics as well. A lot of re reclaimed, like, bus vinyl and things like that. But in terms of plastics, I think she'd be someone that would be an interesting sort of case study to work into some of the things you're talking about. Yeah, thank you. That's great. Can I ask a question here, um, Maybe uh, an obvious question for you, but um, I'm wondering why, why plastic is an afterword in your book? Why, why does that come? Why, why is it structured in that way? Is there any rationale for that, or maybe you can kind of yeah, I mean, I guess there's there's two reasons. Like the um, the um, I don't know what you call it. Like the book's re rationale for doing it is um, because it's removed. Like the most, the actually, it's the same reason. The focus of most of it is digital technology, the trash, glitch, and noise of e-waste and digital technology. And so, because plastic doesn't is earlier, it's older. I use it um, to sh because it allows us a, a slightly removed perspective of the cycle of it. Whereas a lot of when I talk about digital noise and glitch, like I have to explain, like we don't. It's hard to see these things. Like we need to see <coughs> the noise. That's right. We don't see the. I mean, maybe you can see these pixels. They're overwhelmingly clear, but. Um, but we don't see a lot of the noise and the trash of the newest, shiniest things. So that's why plastic is at the end as a kind of um, last thought overview. You mean like historically it should be first because it was earliest? No, I, 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 no, I didn't really have that. Is that what you were thinking though? No, I was, I was just wondering how it, how it was positioned as a, as a glitch. Oh, yeah. So um, the idea is that glitch, noise, trash, accident are like the five core concepts of the book. And so, yes, they each have their own etymological and specific cultural origins and use, but they're also treated analogously. So in the introduction, like I set up each term and how, it, you know, glitch, noise, trash, waste are all sort of devalued others. They've all been given a status that's not privileged in Western culture in the same way that color has. And so, I mean, to really get crazy, like I also say color is also a kind of noise, <laughs> but I won't get into that. Um, so that's the idea of um, plastic <clears throat> waste. Yeah. Well, what do you think of like recycling as a possible response to plastic, the issue of plastic and electric waste supply? What do you mean? Like, what, what do you mean by recycling? Like, is plastic a recyclable, rec recyclable, right? Some of it, or some. I think some plastic, like, but you know, like the fruit containers and stuff are not. And also, yeah. it's hard to know. Like, recycling laws or policies or whatever are so different in different places. Obviously, mm -hmm. some of it is great. And from I met a lady on the plane who's like in charge of recycling <coughs> in Canada or something. And um, she was saying that Ontario has very strong recycling programs. Um, and in California, too, you can get up to like 16 different, in some cities, up to 16 different like bins for different kinds of things that need to go into different recycling things, which is great. Mm -hmm. And I am appalled when I was, you know, staying at my friend's place in New York and like the, telling me, she's telling me like her building fake recyclables, <coughs> like not even comp, like, paper they like fake recycle do you know what i mean and so i i don't know that's what were you thinking about recycling um i don't know nothing too specific but just like 
Like we are so dependent on plastic, so what are ways we could maybe try and mitigate that or something, or yeah, maybe you know use plastics that are recyclable more or things like that. I mean, I don't definitely. And, that's I, you know, it's like Trader Joe's now has like those biodegradable um, plastic bags. Mm -hmm. They smell really rancid, but <laughs> and also just because and just the whole thing of disposable and that's all okay, disposable. So yeah. Like, what are ways we can think of like reusing those these things somehow you know like, yeah in fashion um they do um, <clears throat> some of my students were doing like studies in slow fashion you know because fashion is one of the worst for like mm -hmm. endless seasons of stuff so they're talking about slow fashion and i think in media <clears throat> too right slow media yeah. Dear, yeah oh sorry um <laughs> go ahead <laughs> Um, so I was curious about one thing, because I noticed you were talking about plastic as a media. And normally I think of a media, again, as something that allows something to pass through, whether it be yeah. a signal, information, light, or whatever. And normally I hear pl like plastic is more of a material mm -hmm. as opposed to media. So I just wonder if you can expand, you're relating it to glitch and stuff like that. So normally glitches, again, are something that comes in the process of a signal going through a media and somehow being distorted or mm -hmm. messed up in some way. But I just wonder if you can expand a bit more on how you see plastic as a media versus a material, or media and material, perhaps? Yeah. I mean, I think if you were, um, like, an artist and you were working with plastic, they, <coughs> they, you'd say, like, what medium do you work in? And you'd say plastics or steel or video. <coughs> but again, that's to carry your idea for the plastics also is, like, disposable products. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I see them more as a material. Um, mm -hmm. Because again, it's if you're seeing plastic, like in, in an artist that's using working in steel, steel is their form of like their sort of language of communication. Mm -hmm. um, so in some cases, the plastic could be that, but in other cases, it's more material. So it's being put together as a functional thing. It's not carrying a message forward. So I'm just wondering if you can, like, do, or do yeah, you see a message a, being carried forward in consumer products and stuff in plastic? No, no. I mean, it's the same distinction like Nam June Paik. Like he's where his tel his medium is television, mm -hmm. but we can still go and watch TV, and there's like a material phosphors and, yeah, yeah yeah but just are you seeing it as a media in the case when it's been used for artistic purposes or is it media in a sort of all purposes or all uses of plastic sort of thing oh um like outside of i think it's a, it's a general like this is a general overview and i draw from some artistic uses as mm -hmm. well as like this film wally Right, which is ostensibly about environmental, where it opens with the scene of Wally picking up trash. Mm. And like then you can go and buy these plastic consumer toy. Like it's a whole system, right? It's like <coughs> it's like critical and part of the problem. So I mean, maybe, you know. Maybe plastic is the medium, a metaphor for uh, it's a medium through which capitalism flows. Yeah. <laughs> Well, it w but it would be like a mid-century, it's like a Fordist capitalism, right? It's industrial capitalism. For us, um, we have a different kind of, I think we need a different, that's a nice way of thinking about it. I yeah. did have another question. Just, uh, I just wanted to go back to the sublime. Yeah. Again. Like in your sense of the use of the word, are, are you thinking of it in terms of um, that kind of idea of the unframable, the, the vastness of the of the of the detritus that that that's the level at which it operates as a as a kind of sublime. Um. Well, so I I definitely stick with the uh, I follow in the tradition of the Kantian sublime, and in this case I'm talking about the aesthetic sublime, not the mathematical sublime. Although that is something I talk about where where the numbers and statistics, which I think eventually knows that. Um, anyways. Uh, so yeah, I'm definitely sticking within this tradition of the Kantian aesthetic sublime, where um, the imagination is pushed to the limits. It's introduced to a sense of awe, overwhelming awe by a state of nature or artwork. And then um, reason does the work to recuperate it back into its self-control and to feel self-assured and having exercised its powers of reason. So it's that play between those two, right? But um, I then also update that following um, some of the work on the toxic sublime by people like Jennifer Peoples um, and Jill Gatlin, as well as Deleuze, who writes about, you know, in his own eccentric fashion, a kind of sublime where there is no, 
there's no closure, there's no recuperation, it's left open. So there's this sort of incompossibility of forces between reason, um, you know, not like fear and awe at the same time. So we might see something like this, or even the when some of them where you see all the plastic laid out, and we understand visually the plastic is colorful and we can recognize them as things in our life that we might use and enjoy, but the context is really disturbing and scary. And so that is the idea of, of the sublime. It's unresolved. It's almost impossible to grasp. And it's two forces that are pushing us. So that's why it's retrograde, because it's, it's like pushing us back to our cultural history, the history of technology and how we've used it. And the realities that we face in the present of like, you know, can we do anything about this? Where do we fit in this? Can I even get my head around the like extent of this situation? So it's a sublime that is is dark X-ray. Yeah, I'm just thinking also in terms of how um, just like your question about um, you know what do we do? <laughs> like there is this kind of. Uh, um, almost incomprehensible scale to the problem mm -hmm. also that, that seems to defeat people sometimes or, or, or people feel defeated by it and I and I, I sense some of that kind of notion of the sublime as, as that unframable you know incomprehensible thing that yeah for sure and so in this piece that Evangeline read on um, um, not Jordan Crandall um, Chris Jordan <laughs> Jordan Crandall is the other book um, on Chris Jordan where he uses a lot of statistics like he'll say 100,000 paper cups every five minutes and then show a simulation of 100,000 cups but like again like the number is so big it becomes even harder to get our mind around <coughs> exactly what you're saying so in that case like the sublime becomes even less accessible further up limits I don't know. I, I see. Cause I, I was wondering if that was how you were going to tie into the Bertensky project originally. Yeah, that that um in the Bertensky thing, I talk more about the controversy around his work about making it very um, beautiful, like okay. large scale yeah. luscious beautifulness, and the and the, the the contrast between that and the subject matter. And so there's a. A difficulty, and he's typically, as you know, right, as a Canadian, really only he's given a lot of slack for doing that. But I argue that, well, at least he gets us to engage with it and to become aware of the issues. And um, following, you know, Nietzsche, who, who argues, like, in truth and lies, like, all truth needs to be wrapped in deception and simulation. So it's like a way of enticing us in. If we can't get how dark this is like maybe we need something pretty and nice to bring us at least closer to to a, having a conversation with it so that, that's what my argument of Bertensky for yeah other questions yes yeah sure I guess I really appreciated your question um because that's kind of what I come I come with what I leave presentations like this I'm like well what do we do right yeah um and I, what I found really interesting when you were talking about the way that these like old technologies are taken up in the third world right um like the afterlife yeah. of technologies when they're used here they go there um, and I think it's really interesting to think about how people live with kind of what's left over here you know what I mean on the other side of the world right and I think there's a very particular thing that you might that we can kind of learn from that right um, like my gr my grandmother, she like brought over plastic bags when she immigrated here from India, and she like still has some of them. <laughs> um, but but these things just seem so absurd, right? But I think there's actually way, ways of you know what I mean, living that need to be kind of recycled. The other thing that kind of goes along with that is that when we talk about this like collective effort, do you know what I mean for collective awareness that this is our problem, it's a human problem, it's an anthropocentric problem, right? We're confronted with that category of the human, right? That's like race, class. Right, that kind of begs us to ask, well, who was responsible for this, right? If these corporations are mainly run by like powerful men around the world, right, or have been for so long, um, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I wonder what we do with that, right? Especially with so much discourse around this, like, this anthropocene, which is you know this human-made problem, right? This human rock that we now have, right? It, I'm wondering what your thoughts are on coming to grips with kind of some of those. Like yeah. Tensions, tensions. Well, I mean, I do what I can. Like, 
living here, um, recycling composting is like made really easy. It's like I just have to walk down the hall, right? Um, in New York, like I have to like walk the garbage thing two blocks around to the composting thing, which is only open at certain hours. So, I mean, it's like that. But I've also heard, you know, like um, listened to podcast where someone was like driving two hours to drop off their recycling paper yeah. recycling. So it's really there's there's a level of individual engagement like what can we do like and but then at the same time you know i know i buy stuff that i don't need this do you know what i mean so we're complicit in it it we're that's why we straddle this contradictory position in it so i think we have to acknowledge that and and just like it's not we don't need to like feel um, ashamed or whatever, but just acknowledge, like accept exactly what it is right now, right? And to have more awareness in it. And then, uh, yes, then there is policy, and I'm not a policy maker, I'm not in politics. So, yeah. there's only so much, I think, you know, each person has their role. I don't know, if, I mean, there is a place for us, though, to feel that uh, sense of being ashamed and shame because it's so like radical like it's so radically destructive how mm -hmm. we live really and i think maybe we all need to like acknowledge that we need to massively change the way we the way we live and so i don't know if there's a useful function for for feeling that shame i don't know yeah i i agree with you like with that picture you know yeah and i certainly went through it when i was writing this i mean i'm being recorded right now so i don't really feel comfortable saying what i wanted to say but i mean i i went through that for sure like being seeing it and being in a place where there is a lot of excess of very fancy things right and it's like horrifying to me but i don't have to live with that reality every single day day like you know what i mean yeah yeah it's impossible too we're, yeah we're just stuck in our situation <laughs> exactly yeah <clears throat> wow that's a downer <laughs> <laughs> but there, there is a politics to uh, all of this though right that doesn't that i don't think we're powerless really you know we have decisions we can make there's a <clears throat> vote going on right now that may change the course of the United States, you know, and one of the things that Trump, of course, has done immediately is, is squash all, all kinds of environmental regulations, <clears throat> and, and that's that's a clear, you know, signal of where he wants to go. So I, I personally think there are things we can do, and it's slow though. That's the problem. It's yeah. not a huge ocean liner we're steering onto a reef, perhaps, you know, but, but at least let's try and turn it a little bit, you know. So I, I, I don't know, personally, I, I guess I'm more of an optimist about the, you know, uh, human um, activity. We, we, we did it, we made it, we can change it. So. Well, I also actually saw something today about the ozone, in the newspaper, but the ozone layer is expected to, um, like, heal up within 10 years or something in one area and 50 years in another area. So that is an example of something we've caused and we've changed our behavior and gotten rid of. Uh, whatever the, the aerosols and stuff, mm -hmm. and it has recovered. So. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, it also said that it was warming in Antarctica more now that the ozone layer had closed. Yeah. <laughs> it was better for humans, which I think is more Anthropocene too. Is that it just seems like us this like weird egocentric like we're not trying to save the planet, we're trying to save ourselves. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna jump in and just talk a little bit about about kind of the. The overriding kind of definition that you use, which is a kind of a modernist historical perspective on on plastic as a as a as what it's coming out of petroleum through through a byproduct that's a toxic kind of um, product. Um, but then there are, as I think you mentioned throughout the talk, also the notion of plastic or plasticity as having very kind of progressive. Radical different ways of, of uh, renewing or rethinking or elongating, um, and so so I, I think that there are you know there are some interesting uh, projects now that are trying to kind of capture the same sort of notion of plasticity. I think there's some mm. that are relatively banal like three D printing, which I find to be you know so you know what's being three D printed is not a lot of gun. You know, someone like Captain Mallory, for example, I think 
Yeah, the neuroplasticity. No, yeah, notions that she's trying to push back against that overly scientific modernist definition of, of the classic or the brain rather as hardwired, as, some, as something that we have no choice. <coughs> This is the way in which our brains function. Mm -hmm. And so, so I was just trying to work with that notion of neuroplasticity as a way to kind of think and to kind of confront that that uh, uh, that kind of control model of right, thinking and cognition. And so I know that's a very philosophical and conceptual kind of perhaps response to some of the most recent points, but I think it is a I think it is a fundamentally radical project that that's just trying to make the case that. Plasticity is also about you, we can change things, we can think different ways, we can grow different parts of our brain and different parts of thinking. So it is a very aspirational and hopeful, I think, paradigm, but it's still, I think, it's a, I find it to be a, a compelling and um, more of a comment than a question. Sorry. Yeah, no, that um, that's um, good because I. Um, that's really helpful because I um, had a moment where I was like, is there some way that like Malibu's thing on plasticity can fit into, and I was like, I just didn't see it, but um, because it because I thought it was like using it as a verb, whereas I'm talking about a noun, plastic as a thing, but the way that you just framed it as like thinking about it as a pro as just <laughs> translating it at that process, the action of having plasticity into like a sort of general comment about um, our relationship to environmental damage in general, right? So it's like it's like sort of double play on the words. I like that. I think that's helpful. Any last questions? I don't know my plasticity friends in the room. Um, if not, thanks so much, Carolyn, for sharing. Thank you.